Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Lauren Croys. I'm an associate professor of the history art of the history of art and faculty director of the Hearst Museum of Anthropology here at UC Berkeley. Along with Lee Rayford, associate professor of African American Studies, I'm the co-instructor of LNS 25, Public Art and Belonging. Today's event is th the third in a series of public lectures and conversations organized as part of this class. In considering public art and belonging, we recognize that this class takes place on the ancestral and unceded land of the Ohlone, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. We acknowledge and pay respect to Ohlone ancestors, peoples today, and the Ohlone future to come. This lecture series and course explore relationships between art and belonging, race and place, history, memory, and the imagining of just futures. All talks, as you know, are free to the public and begin at 1210 here in BAM PFA's Osher Theater. For a full schedule and more information, you can see BAM PFA's website or AND's website. Subsequent talks, just to give ourselves a plug, include SF MoMA curator Yunji Ju, who is a UC Berkeley grad, New York-based architect Rodney Leon, in collaboration with UC Berkeley's commemoration of 400 years of resistance to slavery and injustice. We'll also host Harvard art history professor Sarah Lewis, who runs the Vision and Justice Project at Harvard in collaboration with the History of Art Department here at UC Berkeley. We'll be hosting Oakland-based artist Sadie Barnett and SF Experimental Space Programmer Dina Beard, Oakland-based artist Jesus Barza and Melanie Cervantes, Chef and James Beard Award winner Brian Terry, dance director Ronnie Favors, Cafe Alone co-founders Vincent Medina and Louis Trevino, artist Knupa Hansa Luger in collaboration with the Arts Research Center, as well as the San Francisco-based dance artist and director, Daryl Cassell, creative and executive director of SF Soma Arts, <laughs> Maria Jensen, and playwright Justin Chin, in collaboration with TDPS, Theater Dance and Performance Studies, who will be mounting Chin's play, Snowflakes or Rare White People, in April. In our final public lecture, students will present their own proposals for artworks for Berkeley's campus. Of course, an undertaking of this magnitude would not be possible without generous support, financial, logistical, and otherwise. This course is part of the series Thinking Through Art and Design at Berkeley, supported by the Office for Arts and Design, a campus initiative under the steady and visionary leadership of Professor Shannon Jackson that connects and fortifies the creative life of departments, schools, centers, museums, and student clubs throughout the Berkeley campus and in the Bay Area regionally. Arts and Design, or A&D, has organized the Berkeley Arts Passport, offering discounted tickets to art events on Berkeley students' mobile app. It also offers course grants in creative pedagogy and co-curates a range of public lecture series, including Andy Mondays, which is every Monday evening here at BAM PFA. All expenses for this course, including our teaching, our graduate student instructors, our students' access to the arts, and this community lecture series is made possible by AND and by generous philanthropic donations. So thank you. This week, we're so lucky to welcome artists Lava Thomas and Mildred Howard. Both are based in the Bay Area, which we'll hear more about. They also work nationally and internationally. I've had the great pleasure of meeting with and learning from both Lava and Mildred, and I'm so excited to introduce you to them today. So we'll learn more, but to begin, Thomas's studio practice ranges widely across a variety of techniques from drawing, which I show you here, as well as painting, printmaking, and photography, to sculpture and site-specific installations. Here I show you the large-scale drawing Mildred from her hair portrait series. Informed by feminist discourse, alternative approaches to portraiture, secular and religious ideas of the sacred, and African-American devotional and protest traditions, Thomas considers themes of social justice, female subjectivity, current events, and the shifting tides of history. She's a native of Los Angeles, California, and now lives in Berkeley. 
She's been a De Rossi Resident Artist Program Fellow, received the Joan Mitchell Grant for Painters and Sculptors, and has been an artist in residence at the Headland Center for the Arts, amongst other awards. Thomas's work has been exhibited at various institutions, including the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco, also at the Center for African American, uh, sorry, the California African American Museum in Los Angeles, as well as the Berkeley Art Center, where some of you may have seen it, among other venues. Her work is held in the permanent collections of the Smithsonian, SFMOMA, the de Young, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, among other places. I am on a personal quest to convince someone to buy this drawing and donate it to BAM PFA. So I'm just putting it out there for you all now. Think about it, consider it. BAM PFA also owns two works uh, by Mildred Howard. We already own two works by Mildred Howard. We could, of course, use more. Uh, the two works have recently been on display in Way Bay and also in an exhibition which I show you here that Professor Rayford and I co-curated with our graduate class at BAM PFA last year entitled About Things Loved, Blackness and Belonging. And here I'm showing you Mildred's safe house in the center of the gallery. Mildred Howard is an internationally acclaimed artist who grew up in South Berkeley. Known for her sculptural installations and mixed media assemblage works, Howard has been commissioned for numerous public art projects, which we'll talk more about today, including by the Museum of Glass in Tacoma, Washington, the City of Oakland, and the San Francisco Arts Commission, as well as SFO, the San Francisco International Airport. I have, we have a list up here, which you can get on the way out, of her public art commissions that are in the Bay Area. She's also done large-scale installations of her work at Creative Time in New York, at Insight in San Diego, at the National Museum for Women in the Arts, and at the New Museum in New York. She recently received the Lee Krasner Award from the Pollock Krasner Foundation in recognition of a lifetime of artistic achievement, among other awards. She's been exhibiting in the Bay Area since she was a child. From a street festival on Adeline in 1965 to her recent TAP Investigations of Memory, which was recently on view at the Oakland Museum of California. I will say personally, I have learned so much from Mildred, and I often find myself inspired by wisdom that she once shared with my class when I'm doing my like micro attempts to change the world. She told me, quote, bullshit ain't nothing but chewed up grass, end quote. <laughs> Expect more wisdom today. So today, Thomas and Howard will be in conversation with Lee Rayford, who I've already introduced, and Delphine Sims, one of the amazing and extremely patient, as you know, graduate student instructors for this class, LNS 25, who's also a fourth year art history student, a fourth year student in the history of art department as a graduate student. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Lava Thomas and Mildred Howard. Hello, can everyone hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, great. Well, it is, this is, um, I kind of have chills a little bit. Um, a little bit of long time coming. We are so excited to have Lava and Mildred here with us in conversation. Um, and we have been starting um, every session, um, every guest session with um, initial question to kind of just ground us um, and yeah, sure, I'm sure. Okay, here we go. Hello, my mic sounds nice. Check one. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, so the first question, the questions that we've been asking each of our guests um, every week is just to get us started. Is how do you define? How do each of you define public art? Um, and why does public art matter today? <laughs> Um, it's interesting because you and I just had this conversation. Um, can you hear me? 
I think you have to put it really right up to your mouth. There you go. Can you there hear me go. now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, Mildred and I were just speaking about this the other day. Um, and you reminded me that all art is public. All art is made for a viewer. Um, in my case, I don't have artworks that actually exist out in the landscape, and the bulk of my work is in museums or galleries or other um, arts uh, institutions or organizations. Um, when I think about the public, um, I think about art being accessible. So if you have a museum that doesn't charge an entrance fee, that's public to me. If you have an organization that doesn't charge an entrance fee, that's public to me. And even in the case of commercial galleries, um, they're free and open to the public. So any, there isn't a financial barrier. There may be some emotional or psychological barriers that prevent people from feeling welcome, but the art is available for anyone to view. When you talk about institutions that do charge an entry fee or um, require a membership for admission, that doesn't feel public to me at all. And can you, can you say a little bit about um, why public art matters? Oh, um, art that exists in the landscape that's created to um, last for posterity is extremely important because um, as we know, this country is contending with its history of Confederate and colonial monuments. And that, um, those monuments tell a history that, have been, that has been um, really harmful and violent uh, to people of color, to black people in particular. And it upholds a legacy of slavery in, under the guise of protecting heritage and history. So folks of color, black people in particular, really need to be creating these monuments and artworks that exist in the public landscape for posterity so that we can tell our own stories, so that our history, which is systemically being erased, um, will be present for, not just for the present, but for the future. Thank you. Mildred? I, I agree with Lava that, well, there's, there are artists who never show their work. Uh, the artists who, for example, the artists who did his work out of uh, gum wrapper papers and his work is now, he did this, this large altar. And then when he passed away, they found his work and now it's in the Smithsonian. So there are tons of works like that. But I too feel that art is public and available for anyone to see. And one of the things as artists is that we don't have to be so uptight that where we only show in museums, we only show in galleries. And what, the, what work in the public realm offers that. I don't consider myself a public artist in, in the traditional definition of art. I, I consider myself an artist who does work both in the public realm and I also show in galleries and museums. So I think by showing work in the public, it provides an arena for those who may not have the opportunity or may not have time to go to a gallery or for whatever reason, it is there for them. And I agree, uh, it's time that we show our, tell our story. I mean, you know, you guys all know Sun Ra. Uh, at the old museum in Berkeley, uh, he performed there and he was running all through the space uh, with his uh, van. But he always said, you know, history is his story. Now what's your story? So. As artists, we're storytellers. And we also talk about things that, that are probably not spoken about at all. And one of the, I feel one of my responsibilities is to 
talk about those who are invisible. And chocolate is the flavor of the month right now. So, but it hasn't always been that way. It hasn't even been Neapolitan. But um, black people have really suffered in, 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 in uh, this country. And when I look at, I live now on San Pablo. There were 12 black men standing around. No job, no money. Who's going to talk about them? Yeah, someone could call the police and have them arrested and all that, but that's, that's not what it's about. When Trump can get away with what he did, psh, come on. Well, I'd like to ask you to move into this storytelling um, and let us know uh, some of uh, your favorite public art commissions that you've worked on, some of the ones you're most proud of. Well, you know, I'm always interested in the one that I'm working on now. It, I, because that's the one that I'm most involved with. I'm working on several. What do you have? Oh. Oh, I love this one too. This one, um, this one was a challenge for me because I don't usually do things that are like pretty in, in that kind of sense. But what's so interesting about this, this is the Acute Care Center for San Francisco General Hospital. That's where I was born. So, and it's for the acute care. And why can't they in the last days of their life see something that's about beauty. Yeah, and, and the they're title. all native, they're based on native plants of this area. So I went around to, went up to the Hertz Garden, all over uh, photographing flowers that I then, then put onto the glass. And I worked with um, a glass uh, company in, um, in Oakland on this one. I remember seeing this with you and getting goosebumps when you told me the title. Oh, forever, forever yours. yours. Yeah. Yes. Forever, forever yours. yours. Let's see. And there's a, it's the whole floor of that. This is the San Francisco airport. Uh, I did this right at as the Western edition, but I call it the Fillmore, was changing. And at one point, all up and down Fillmore Street, there were black-owned businesses, businesses. And just like today, in almost every single major city in this country, there's uh, the, a lack of black folks. Oakland is, I think, now 11%, when at one time it was 48%. But you know, my mother told me something interesting. She said, these white folks are going to get sick of driving from Walnut Creek, and they're going to move back to the city where it's easy to get around. And, that's exact, and you won't be able to buy a house in the neighborhood we live in. I mean, things like that are happening. And I'm saying this because artists are multifaceted. We don't just do one thing. We're just like all of you. We have other things that we're interested in. We have families. We have rent to pay or mortgage to pay. We care about our loved ones. It's, but we make art. A library, these are palindronic letters on uh, dichroic glass at a library in uh, Sacramento. So you can read the letters either in any direction. And it separate, separates the children's uh, area from the adults. And I imagine children trying to make up words with these 11 letters of the alphabet. And as the light changes, the color changes. This will be in Battery Park City in May, if we get everything, or, or a little bit later of this year. And I, this, was, this is installed, was installed at the Sacramento airport. It belongs to them. 
when I did this piece, uh, what was interesting about it is that I did all this investigation on historic letters. And the amount of racism in the letters talking about people from various parts of the world, whether you were Jewish or Mexican or black or Asian, it was just like so derogatory. So what I did is I took those letters and I blew them up really large. So when you walk into the space, there are fragments of the letters that have been mirrored. So you're standing in the present, but looking at yourself in the past in these fragments of the letters. So this being placed down on the promenade near where you could see the Statue of Liberty is even more important now, especially when we, I mean, you don't even hear anything about these kids on the border. Yeah. I wanna ask a, a follow-up question um, in that your public works, your works always have something um, that is engaged with history and always trying to make visible, make visible those histories that have been invisibilized. Um, what's the, what are the core questions that you ask yourself as you develop a public art project? What kinds of concerns do you have? Well, there, before I ask that question, there are always a set of guidelines that uh, whoever is commissioning the project has. There are always a set, where is it going to be? What is it for? How will it be used? All of those things. Uh, how long does it have to last? Those are like sort of standard. And for public art, it's 50 years. 50 years, I mean, it's, so those are pretty standard. But then, who am I, who am I, who do I want this? Who do I want to see this? What do I want that person to get out of this work that I'm doing. And so I go back and forth between being the spectator and the viewer and the maker or the view. Yeah, all of those. I just go back and forth. And I've heard you say that you always put, there's always some element of every commission that's, that's for you. It has to be for me. Specifically for you. It has to be because if it's not, then why do it? Why do it? Why do it if it's not for me? If I don't like it, why should I expect someone else to? Um, Lava, you were saying that a lot of your, um, you know, that you don't haven't necessarily put a lot of work um, in the public, but it has your work has such um, a, a public dimension um, that it is either representing shared democratic histories or bring, also bringing to light marginalized figures um, as well as no, um, historical movements. So can you tell us a little bit about, about walk us through some of your work as well? And, um, it's a little bit further down. The, I'd say the majority, can you hear me? The majority of my work is uh, based on portraiture. And so working in portraiture, I'm, also working with people, okay. I'm working with people, and that's the public dimension. It's a co-collaboration in many uh, respects. There have been a few projects that have specifically been um, co-collaborations. There was one project, okay, this, for example. Um, the hair uh, portraits were, uh, it was, a, it was a project that was really based on a transaction. Um, I was thinking about identity. I was thinking about forensic identity, really thinking about stretching the conventions of portraiture and creating a portrait that didn't necessarily convey the likeness of a person. So our hair contains our DNA. Again, it's used for forensic identity. And so I asked people um, to give me their hair after they cut it um, when you think about cutting one's hair, it's the easiest part of our image that we can shape and change. Um, it's not like, when I think about, it's not like I can lose 20 pounds overnight and then fit into a size four outfit. So um, 
that transaction was really meaningful. A lot of people wanted me to uh, draw their hair, but they weren't willing to give me their hair as a gift. So, and in the case of Mildred, you weren't required to cut your hair at all. <laughs> so I started this series in the uh, early to mid 2000s. It's an ongoing uh, project. And after a while, after this body of work became known, folks just started giving me their hair, which is a very sort of strange thing. I didn't get actually a lot of hair from um, African-American folks because there's, there's this history around, um, if, I remember my great-grandmother telling me this story. So if you had someone's hair, you had the ability to cast a spell either for good or for bad. So that, that cultural knowledge has been passed down through generations. People don't even understand why they don't give their hair to someone, especially a stranger, anymore. But that sense of being able to control someone's destiny by owning something that was once a part of their body is very much in the culture. My great-grandmother used to um, make us burn our hair yeah. if it fell on the floor. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, when you talk, do you want to talk about the, they can't the hear you. sorry, the veterans sure. project? Sure. That a very bit? that project, and there are just a few portraits here, was very much a collaboration. It was a project that um, I was commissioned to do by the Palo Alto Art Center, and it was um, a project where the mandate was to work with a particular community group of your choosing. I wanted to work with veterans because that is a community that I know very little about. Um, during my commute to the studio, I would see a homeless vet, and I really wondered what that story was like, but I was really not, I wasn't really courageous enough to approach him or other veterans that I would see on the street. So I contacted veterans organizations to try to get um, access to that community. It's a very close community. If you are not a veteran or if you don't uh, come from sort of a military family. So finally, I um, contacted a gentleman. I explained what my uh, project was like and he gave me entree to other veterans. So the project entailed photography, um, we also did a video, and I had them answer questions about their identity. So what was interesting is that when you look at the portrait and their contributions, which also included uh, photographs from their military era, it seemed very pro-military, but then when you listen to the video, um, listen to the audio of the video, that's when these stories about uh, suicide or uh, drug addiction or the difficulty of transitioning back into civilian life or PTSD. It was a very interesting project in that there was a public and private component. Um, all of the veterans that I interviewed, and there were 12 um, that were part of this series, um, felt that the military gave them this very strong sense of identity um, and pride despite all of the obstacles that they faced in their civilian life. And even in the military, there were women who talked about being, especially the, the women who were veterans early on from the 70s that talked about um, sexual attacks, being the only female in their unit and being harassed constantly that was not something that they included in the public part of that portrait. Move forward a little bit. Um, I would love for you to talk, well, um, I'm gonna skip past the, the performance okay. um, because I think the series, the Montgomery Bus, Women of the Montgomery Bus Boycott, um, as well as um, the, the tambourine works, also speak to rethinking our shared mm -hmm. national um, history sure. and the kinds of myths that we perpetuate and right. need, to be, uh, need to undo. 
You want to start? With? Or maybe we can actually, um, I mean, these are incredible works. I mean, it's sort of, actually, maybe, do you want? Let's go back to it. Okay. Yeah. Or we can talk about um, Charleston Requiem or. Right. I'll talk about Mugshot. Okay. Oh, you, okay. So yeah. let me go forward to yeah. Mugshot. I like this because this was in the show that I co-curated last year. <laughs> Cam. Um, but let's go to the, the, the full series. So Mugshot Portraits, Women of the Montgomery Bus Boycott, um, came out of a time during, we're really thinking, thinking about um, the racist rhetoric and the misogynistic rhetoric that came out of the 2016 presidential campaign. And then, and also the fact that um, it seemed to me that hard-won civil rights laws and protections were being, were just under attack. So I started thinking about ways that I could revisit the civil rights movement, but also thinking about the public history of the civil rights movement. When we think about the civil rights movement, who do we think of? Everybody. Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks. Okay, come on, let, let's hear. The, 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 the. Okay, we, we live in a country that likes to valorize a few people around a movement that involved literally thousands of people. So this history of women's contributions to the civil rights movement is really not, with the exception of Rosa Parks refusing to give up her seat, and even that is told in a mythological way. Um, women's contributions are not part of this public history, and I wanted to bring women's labor, women's contributions, women's leadership, and women's initiative back into this story, because the truth is that women organized the Montgomery bus boycott. Martin Luther King, after the fact, was elected to lead it, but he did not start it. He didn't initiate it, he didn't organize it. So looking at um, the, that history, looking at it more closely, looking at the leaders, the women leaders who were arrested, my goal was to honor their sacrifice, their leadership, honor their labor by transforming mugshots, which are representations of criminality into commemorative portraits that are full size. I chose to draw them because drawing is, uh, is, is accessible, it's understandable. Most of us in this room have held a pencil. Most of us in this room have done some mark making with a pencil, unlike painting, which not everyone has an experience with. So this idea of accessibility, openness is embedded. The labor um, conceptually is embedded in the drawings as well because I build the drawings with literally thousands of strokes. Um, I chose to draw this as well on paper because paper is fragile, as you know, it can be erased. Um, if a drawing isn't in a temperature-controlled room uh, where light is controlled, it can fade. So this idea of us preserving this history as well is embedded in the materiality of the work. Um, you want to come I'd like to uh, keep with uh, talking about your work, Lava, and maybe move us into a way we can talk about a contentious moment um, in your work, uh, to think about these controversies that come around from uh, commissioning public art from artists. Um, so can we have you talk a little bit about um, what it means to have your work uh, limited in your process, um, someone who's sort of trying to subscribe a particular vision onto your work, um, and maybe if you could touch on the realities of what artist labor is and how bureaucratic that can be when you're commissioned. I said commissioned works. Let's go to... Um, So this piece, Resistance Reverb Movements 1 and 2, it was 
commissioned by uh, the DeRosa Center for Contemporary Art in Napa. Um, this was 2018. And actually with this work, um, they gave me a huge space and didn't make any demands at all, except that it didn't hurt anyone. <laughs> no, I take that back. We were, we were given um, themes to choose from. Um, it had to be thematic. So my theme, the theme that I chose, and they didn't give us the, ch they didn't give us the themes. They said, we want it to be thematic, but it can be whatever you want. Um, mine was solidarity, and I chose solidarity um, because I was seeing this country become more and more polarized. Um, the language that was being used, um, po both politically and socially, um, it just seemed to me that this uh, sort of kumbaya moment that we were all celebrating under Obama's <laughs> presidency was disappearing rapidly. So I um, use tambourines in my work. To me, uh, the tambourine is an instrument that speaks to our common humanity. It's an instrument whose history is rooted in cultures around the globe. It doesn't require special training in order to play it. And it's used both in praise, but it's also used in protest. Um, it's one of the earliest, uh, it's one of the instruments that children play early on and, oh my God, they're, it's, it's a racket, but anyway. <laughs> so um, I wanted to use the tambourine in this piece. I had envisioned a very large tambourine piece that takes the aesthetics from the 2017 Women's March that, um, that was a global, uh, Act of protest, the largest um, act of pro global act of protest in the world. And on the tambourine, some of them have mirrors, some of them have plexi, some of them have pink leather. But I've written excerpts of political speeches by women dating back to the 1800s. Mariah Stewart, uh, the first African American. Um, political writer, Sojourner Truth, um, Yuri Kochiyama, Dolores Huerta, and on and on. I think I have about uh, 20 uh, women whose um, speeches, excerpts of their speeches are found within that piece. I also included mirrored tambourines and a wall of mirrored tambourines so that viewers can become a part of the piece and really can consider what is their role in shaping our democracy, what is their role in voicing resistance, and what is their role as a citizen in this country. Oh, so let's, let's keep going here, because yeah. both of you have talked um, a little bit about um, the constraints, or that right, every commission is a pro or every invitation to submit a proposal has a set of parameters. Um, and one of the sets of slides that Mildred, you're, you've shared with us, is a set of unrealized projects. Um, and let's see if we can, I have to, well, we'll go back and forth. Um, but we also wanted to take the time to talk, to follow up on Delphine's question to talk about what those challenges are, what the process has been. Um, Lava, if you're willing to share about what's been going on in the San Francisco Art Commission, <laughs> right? So, um, so maybe actually if we um, think, if we can start, we'll start with Lava and then I wanna go back to Mildred's unreali unrealized projects because I think also thinking about um, potential histories and potential other projects, right? And the projects that we all sort of have in mind um, for the spaces that we inhabit. They're also ones that I didn't get. Exactly, well, and, yeah. and then there's that. I was, I was trying to yeah. be a, right. I, was trying to, I was trying to spin that into, um, you know, all, all the ways that right. we imagine otherwise. I want to comment on this piece. Sure. So you all saw the uh, iteration of it at DeRosa. It was acquired by Hall Arts Hotel in Dallas. And 
it's interesting because DeRosa charges an admission, so everyone wasn't able to actually see it. Now, at Hall Arts Hotel, the lobby is a public space, but the barrier, it's in a very luxurious space. Um, Hall Arts Hotel has, um, um, well, Hall Arts is a collecting, not institution, but a collecting company. And within this uh, hotel, there's works by Spencer Finch, Carrie Mae Weems, and others. So they're, they were very intentional about putting artworks within um, the hotel space. But again, there are barriers to seeing this work because it's in a luxury hotel. It's very expensive to stay there. So I'm constantly grappling with um, like, where do I want my work to be? But the reality is that my work has to sell to support my studio. And so I don't always um, um, have, it's not, I always have a choice, but I always have to sort of walk this line of, okay, it's not really public, but I'm glad you said that because so many pe people don't realize that art is a business. It is a business. It's also a discipline. We have to study, constantly study and perfect our craft. And if we don't, I mean, if we don't sell, we don't work. Real simple. And all of the labor you're putting into putting these proposals together, that's unpaid well, the, for they, many of them. It's, they do give you, for some of them, but they do give you like a, a tiny honorarium. But it does not cover all, I've been doing it for a long time, so you know, it does not cover all the expenses. But they give you a little something. There was at one point where they didn't give you nothing. Now they give you, you know, some parking meter money. I look forward to that in my future life. Maybe you could both walk us through the process of, um, of what it means to propose, to, to answer a call oh, for God. proposals, and when it goes well, and when it does not. Well, when, when it, I'll go for when it doesn't. Can you go to Unreal Lives? Yes. When I first started off, I was like heartbroken. But, and sometimes, I'm, I'm disappointed still, but I realize that they don't deserve it. Uh-oh, it's gone. Unrealized, exactly. Uh, can you go to mine? So there, there, there normally is a call for artists. And that's if it's uh, city, government, something like that. But then there are those who will call you and say, we want you to do this piece for a street in San Francisco. So private and, pub and private uh, corporations are a lot different, but they have their challenges than, than uh, government entities or city and government entities. This is a piece that was a call for uh, the Berkeley uh, South Berkeley Library, a library that I attended when I was a child. And it's based off uh, uh, the Belgium artist Marette. This is not a pipe. So I had, this is probably a drinking fountain. That was the tile wall, and it was going to go in all these different languages in the library. Next door to the South Berkeley Library is a Buddhist temple. And the Buddhist temple was once a house where um, a high school friend lived. She lived in the house, and we, I would go visit her, and then we would run back and forth to the library. So I'm thinking, OK, Berkeley is somewhat diverse. Why not address? And, the li and a library is one of the most democratic institutions that we have in this country. It's free and open to the public, and their books. So I wanted to do a play on that with this one. Let's go to the next. Um, a, a letter, uh, a historic letter written on the wall 
on, on the windows of the, uh, the millions of the Sacramento airport. They didn't go for this one, but they went for the Purple House because that's another thing. When people see you, do, when the public or those commissioning you see you do something that catches the eye, they think that's all you could do. So yes, I use writers and poets because they help me to see in a different way. But that's not all I do. So that's another thing. That's, that was for Fort Mason. And that's a hook, uh, a longshoreman's hook that pulled up what I was going to have. I wasn't going to have a rock. I was going to have a rock, but I couldn't find one in time to do this, uh, um, do the proposal. So I just found a piece of concrete and put it in that. That's the, live, the senior center in Berkeley. I mean, these are only a few things. I, there are hundreds that I don't get. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And people say you do everything. Oh, no, I don't do everything. <laughs> this one, they were ridiculous not to do. Now, I'll, have, I'll tell you a story. <laughs> they should have taken this one. All over the world, people play dominoes. But let me tell you this. M me, Allison Saar, Joe Sam, and Amanda Johnson, not one of us got it. They turned it back, not one. If you're really interested in representing African Amanda, choose all of us. Raise some more money and have all of us do a piece. Talk about um, okay. So let's try and, and I don't want to explode the PowerPoint again. But <laughs> why don't you go ahead and just start talking about sure your experience? Um, my only foray into public art and my only experience um, with the process did not go well. Um, I was invited to apply for the uh, sculpture honoring Dr. Maya Angelou for the San Francisco Main Library. Um, and I was thrilled that I was invited. I hadn't considered it because, as I said, public art is not um, something that I really thought about doing. But with an invitation and with Mildred's encouragement, <laughs> I applied. Um, I was thrilled to discover that I uh, made the semifinalist cut and then super thrilled to find that I was one of three finalists. And the, uh, the process is very exacting mm. and it's in stages and there are, um, uh, there's a lot you have to do. The, Stipend, you call it, it, it really is parking meter money because our intellectual and creative labor isn't compensated for no. at all, at all. And the expense that we incur to create the proposal, it has to look a certain way. It's, they're very specific about what they want. It, that stipend barely even covers that cost. I'm not an, an artist who works with uh, digital media, so I hi had to hire someone to do all of my imaging, and then you have to have it printed um, under very strict specifications. So we're not paid. It pays no. expenses, but we are not paid, and I want that to be very clear. <laughs> um, oh, here we are. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, no, let's back up. Do you have some of the documents there? Let's go back one more. Uh, no, go forward, go, okay. So the request for qualification specifically said, review criteria will include artistic evidence, excellence as evidenced by portraiture and the ability to capture the spirit of the subject. There was nothing in the original RFQ that said sculpture. There was nothing in the original RFQ that said expertise sculpting the figure. It said ex expertise in portraiture. 
which is the bulk of what I do? Now we can go to the next one. No, let's go back one more. Go back, go back. That one. Um, let me just give you a little bit of background about this, um, this sculpture. It's mandated through legislation. So San Francisco has close to 90 monuments to men, mostly white men, and only two monuments to women. So there's, there was legislation that was passed to um, amend this gender imbalance. Since we are now, at, in 2020, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote. The original legislation had statue, but it wasn't passed because the Arts Commission wanted to give artists more creativity, um, more freedom in how they would represent Dr. Angelo. So you can see here, statue is crossed out and artwork is replaced. This commission, uh, this sculpture commission to Dr. Angelo is the first of a uh, initiative to increase the represent representation of women in San Francisco's public arts holdings to 30%. And this was highly publicized. Um, part of the uh, press around um, publicizing it, the Arts Commission wanted a contemporary and a forward-looking representation of Dr. Angelo, which makes sense. We're talking about the city of San Francisco that has a reputation for being progressive. We're talking about Maya Angelou, who defied tradition in every sense of the word, okay? She not only was the first African-American woman conductor for the city of San Francisco, she defied boundaries in all areas of her life. And for me, Dr. Angelo really represents this idea of potentiality, for freedom, what it means as a black woman artist, what, what is possible to achieve as a black woman artist. So I was, I was on, deeply honored to be a finalist, really excited to be an, a finalist, and the competition was rough, I'll be honest. <laughs> and as much as it's possible for finalists to be collegiate, it was a very wonderful experience because we respected one another's body of work, we respected one another, and really uh, wished each other well going into the presentation. Can you say a little bit about why it's, you chose, why it's important to not necessarily represent oh, Dr. Sure. Angela in the form of a, of of a, a statue, statue? Of a statue. Mm -hmm. So for my proposal, I wanted to give the city of San Francisco a new icon and a new way of thinking about monumentality, especially when you think about black women. And as I mentioned before, this country is in the process of contending with its history of colonial and confederate monuments, which are all created in the classical Eurocentric uh, tradition of representing the figure. I chose a book, not just because it's the library, but because, and there's a slide, if you go further, let's go a little further. Here, okay. I, here. It was important to me that my monument be situated in black art. So I embraced the rectangularity of the Benin bronzes. I also looked at um, Elizabeth Catlett's um, monument to Ralph Ellison, which is in a rectangular form. So this idea of a book is a little, there's much more to it than just a rectangular book. The book also, for me, um, is a symbolic repository of Maya Angelou's life and of her work. She was not only a poet, she wrote autobiography. So she represented her own life in words, in her own words, not biography, not writing about somebody else, but writing about her own life. So all of my formal and conceptual choices were based on Maya Angelou's own words, how she 
um, described her uh, philosophy about her life and work, her aesthetics. I looked at her art collection, and I based the portrait, and let's go back to the portrait. Okay, I based the portrait on a 1973, still from a 1973 interview with Bill Moyers where she talks about the cost of freedom, the freedom to live in the way that she chose, the freedom to create, the freedom to express herself, the freedom to travel. Um, there's a point where Bill Moyers asks her, where do you belong? Do you be and she says, and I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember the quote exactly. She says, at one point you realize that true freedom means you belong no place in every place. And then he asks, who do you belong to? And she says, I belong to myself. Thank now, you. if that's not a powerful declaration of self, self-awareness, I don't know what is. 1973 is also significant because it's the year that Roe versus Wade was codified into law. There were all of these resonances to our current political moment. 1973 was the year that the Nixon impeachment hearings began. I also chose that interview because it was a year when she lived in Berkeley, which is a little known fact. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I did move. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> a little known fact. So, she'd have coffee on Alcatraz and um, College Avenue at a place called the Buttercup. And she took classes, danced, because she was a dancer at Shaw Anderson. Oh, the rainbow sign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was. She was. She was very much Bay Area. Then. She was very much. She Bay wasn't quite Maya Angelou then, to some people. Right. Mm -hmm. But she was to a certain population. I mean, yeah. and, and what's so I think so significant about all of the things that you're saying, the the lineages, the thought that went into the process, and then ultimately, you won the commission and then it was rescinded because the commission I'll go there. wanted well we're I just want to make sure we get that's, there. That's, that that's the bullshit. Time. Right. So that's let's let, actually so yeah let's for sake of time let's let's get to the let's get to the bullshit. Let's get okay. to the bullshit. Um, the chew the and then, grass. And because then what we want to open it up for questions okay. before one thirty. Um on August 9th I received a phone call after the three after we each made our presentations. And I want to give a shout out to Kenyatta because she was one of the finalists and your work is so awesome. Yay. <laughs> Yay. It is awesome. Awesome. Um, I got a call saying that I won and I couldn't believe it really yeah. because as I said, the competition was super stiff. I was thrilled. I was thrilled. I was told that, um, I'm sorry, because it, it's, it's still, to this day, it's, it's upsetting. Um, I was told that a contract would be forthcoming. In fact, that was my last email from the Arts Commission, that a contract would be forthcoming after the August 21st meeting of the Visual Arts Committee, where it would be approved, and that's usually what happens, okay. It did not happen. I received a call after the Visual Arts Committee meeting telling me that the sponsors of the project preferred the second place proposal, which was a more figurative work. And I honestly couldn't believe it. This is the first time that I've applied for a public art commission. Um, the way that it was all presented to me and to the other finalists, we followed all of the guidelines, okay? In addition to that, as a professional artist, I apply for residencies, I apply for grants, I apply for these things all the time. 
And I understand that a lot can happen within the room where those selections are being made, but after it happens, that selection is inviolate. It's the only professional guarantee that working artists have. Some artists are fortunate enough to have teaching jobs, health right. insurance, those kinds of things. But when we apply for any number of things, when we're told that we won, we expect that to be the last word. And we're just waiting for the letter mm -hmm. to tell us that this is, in fact, true. In the case of public art, and I don't know if this is true beyond the city of San Francisco, but in the city of San Francisco, legally, they can, after you have been selected, they can rescind that selection. They can rescind a contract. Based after on the, a number of reasons. After, Just, right. Just after, even, if, even if they don't like it. Even if they don't like it after the contract has been granted. So for me, it's a, it was a, a three-step process. There's, you get the top ranking, it's approved by the Visual Arts Committee, and then it's approved by resolution by the full um, commission. Arts Commission. Um, I didn't know what was going on. All of my attempts to get information, to get clarification, um, my request for a meeting with the Director of Cultural Affairs, my letters requesting documentation through the Sunshine Ordinance, which the City of San Francisco is required to grant, I was stonewalled at every turn. So for two months, I didn't know what was going on, and finally, at the October, so I was told in August, at the October meeting of the Visual Arts Committee, Let's move forward. Let's go back one. That. <laughs> this is what happened. Yeah, I mean, she sashayed in, said, I'm a lawyer, and I wrote this. And it was, the, the audience was filled with artists. And it just took everything I could not to stand up. Then she walked out. She didn't wait for any other comments. It was the most egregious, disrespectful, dismissive act on the part of, I won't even say a politician, just a part, on a part of a human being <laughs> toward another human being. Mm -hmm. The audience was packed and packed primarily with women of color. It this commission was the first time in the city of San Francisco that a critical mass of black women were invited to participate in a process to honor another black woman, only to have our intellectual labor, our creative labor, dismissed and disregarded in such an egregious way by an attorney with no art background saying that I will tell you what my words meant. She wanted to honor Maya Angelou in the same way that men, and read white men, have historically been elevated in the city. That's so wrong. It perpetuates hegemonic violence. It perpetuates the colonial gaze. Patriarchy is so fossilized in her mind. This is anti-feminist, it's anti-black, it's anti-innovative. It was infuriating and it was an insult. The way that it happened was an insult to every artist, every woman, and in, particularly, in particular, every black woman who was in the room that day. It's truly, for our students especially in their reading today, it is the fallacy of a democratic process for art commissioning too, the way that one person can, can make these <coughs> ultimate decisions. It was one person up there, but there were numerous behind her. Yes. 
So a as we, one of the questions that's been, that um, one of our students asked last week um, in um, the context of Jeff Chang's conversation about gentrification and resegregation um, and that this really, the egregious actions of the supervisor call up is really what, how do we um, support artists, especially women artists, black women artists, in the context of <coughs> gentrification, resegregation, and a very, you know, a changing arts landscape. And so I, I guess I want to ask before we move to open it up to audience questions, what kind, how do you see this, these um, processes changing and what kind of support as black women artists would you like to see moving forward? Oh, there was a lot of press. The Bay Area arts community was outraged. I want to note that if you want to follow this progression as a particular fan of Instagram, you can look at Lava Thomas, and I would imagine that's a different uh, way to support her as well. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. One of the things they can do is, is to show up at these meetings because they are public meetings. All of them are public meetings. The panel meetings, the selection process, it's all public. It's our taxpaying do dollar. And another thing to do is to vote. To vote and to write letters and make your voice heard. Write letters, make your voice heard. Um, I want to thank everyone in the community who's been supportive and in particular see black women. Uh, which is spearheaded by Angela Hennessy, who is on the selection panel. There will be mobilizations um, on that site, so follow it. You can back up one. Back up. Okay. Write letters. Well, another thing is don't 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 stop at at this project, because that's what's wanted. Don't stop. The project has been reopened. The new request for Fair qualifications other. dropped last Friday. Um, you know, anyone who participates is implicitly mm -hmm. supporting the actions by Catherine Stephanie. Any artist who participates in this new round of proposals any selection panelist who agrees to um, judge those proposals is implicitly endorsing Catherine Stephanie's actions. I want that clear. What I'm, but what I'm saying is, not that project, there are other projects that'll come up and it'll be way better. <laughs> I mean, that is, when you think about it, Lava, it's, Difficult as this was, there's so much more waiting. They don't deserve it. That's number one. They don't deserve it. No. But someone else will. Yeah. Well, we have one final question um, that we're asking of all of our speakers, um, and it's particularly for our students for their final project in the class. Um, Given your relationships to the city, what new public art would you like to see? And Mildred, I'd like you to go first, considering the city loves you so much you have a day named for you. March 29th, everyone. Um, I, you know, it just, that's like a big question. What would I like to see? That, that goes back to what I said earlier. Where is, where will it be? Who is, I mean, what is the the targeted audience? Yes, it's for the public. Where is it indoor or outdoor? So that's kind of a big question. But yeah, you know, I have a bunch of those unrealized projects. <laughs> you can take any one of the those, and I'm for willing you all. to do it. And I didn't even show you all of them. So any of those will work. Yeah. Lava. Um, 
a larger question than what do I want to see because I, I don't really think in those terms. I want to, but what I do want to see when folks are applying for those opportunities is a transparent and democratic selection process that is not derailed by political maneuvering. The integrity of the selection process is all for us. And that's what I want to see upheld. And it's our money that's being used. We all pay taxes. And we can't forget that. Thank you, Lava. Thank you, Mildred. We will open it up for questions. So for those of you who are just joining us for the first time, the way we proceed is that um, students in LNS 25 have submitted questions. Um, and we're going to take, um, take um, one or two of those. And then we'll open it out to other questions. We'll take one. We think it says Madeline. No, but it could be Mackenzie. Is Mackenzie a person? Okay. Oh, that's a terrible handwriting. I do. <laughs> that's unfortunate. Okay, hi. So what I wrote, I'll just read it verbatim. Uh, when you're working on something new, what does your target audience look like? In particular, I was thinking of perhaps categories like maybe people who are wealthy or influential enough to enact change as like a call to action, or perhaps those who are most affected by, uh, or they're subject to other people's whims, like who are you looking to make artwork for, I guess? When you're working? Uh, when, when you're- Making it? Making art. I'm yeah, thinking about the, the work. The um, work itself. How does this work? How does this? How does it? How does it work as a work of art? I'm not always thinking about oh. If I'm working in my studio on um, a piece that's going to show in a gallery, I want to make sure that all the elements that I lay down, that if one mark has a relationship to everything else around it and everything else around that mark has a relationship to it. I don't, I'm not thinking about, oh, what will this person say or what will that person say? It's that mark making process. That's for me. Now, if it's a big public art, there are specific things that I need to address. And I go back and forth trying to see if I've addressed those criteria, but at the same time, I'm always looking at the other. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The second question is going to be from Nigella. Up there. Um, I've been having many conversations with friends about um, the role of art in society. Um, and I was wondering if there's a moment when you realize the importance of public art um, in the modern context, maybe an art piece that you saw or a conversation that you had. I can't really <laughs> think back to a moment, but... Um... In the last few years, the discussion around Confederate and can, uh, colonial monuments shaping this um, narrative around uh, history and heritage versus genocide and slavery, um, that debate that continues today is extremely important. 
Do you feel like that um, encounter shifted the scale of your work or shifted the materials you wanted to work with? Um, when I applied for the Maya Angelou um, commission, that was the first time I really considered bronze, for example, or marble or permanent uh, materials and also thinking about uh, scale, uh, something that's a portrait that's essentially nine feet tall. I hadn't done anything like that. Although I have portraits that are six feet tall, but uh, not created in, in bronze. So applying for that really got me on this track of um, thinking about monumental uh, materials. So we have time for a couple of questions, and what we want to do is just um, we'll take the questions and then we'll answer them. So right there, um, right there, Marguerite and Tara, yeah. and right there. So we'll take those. Um, oh, thank you. Um, you touched on something there at the end that I find very distressing: the idea that. One that's very prevalent in the city of San Francisco right now is that you could decide that you're going to erase history, that you're going to cover up a mural that was done at Washington High School that spoke that artist's idea about the society in which he lived. I do have a problem with taking down monuments because they need to be explained. They need to be taught. People need to understand why those things are repugnant so they don't repeat themselves. I, I, I find it extremely disturbing what happened to you with the Maya Angel, that a group of people who have no understanding of the process can walk in on it and kill it. And I don't know what the solution to that is. I don't know how to communicate <coughs> that when you try to erase history, you erase things that inform us about who we should or should not be. Uh, am I on the right track here? And um, we're going to give a thought to that, and then <coughs> take the second the second question. Hi, Laura <coughs> and Mildred, and everyone. Um, I just got back from Sacramento. I had to rush over here because I wanted to have something to say about this process. I'm with the California Arts Council, She's and here we the California Arts Council chair of the California Arts Council. <laughs> but we, we have processes where you go through the peer panel process, where the work is adjudicated by a peer panel, and then the council uh, funds based on uh, what the recommendations are. And that process is a <coughs> transparent process. For me, the problem is more people do not participate in it. So they don't realize what you have to go through, what you have to go through to to uh, apply, what you have to go through to get um, approved, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's really important for anyone who's here to know that it is a public process. The meetings are all public. It may feel like it's not public because it's behind a closed door. You have every right to be in all of those rooms and have your, 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 your opinion heard. Um, for me, Lava, you know, I've, we've been talking back and forth about this since before the hearing in City Hall uh, at the uh, Arts Commission, which was, as you say, egregious. People were making comments that had no idea what they were talking about. They knew nothing about art. And um, I love your piece. In fact, I, I thought that this young lady, I loved your piece. I would just love to know where you're going to put it. Because all that work needs to go somewhere. In fact, someone in the audience say, well, what's the opposite of figurative? And I'm thinking, you dummy. <laughs> <coughs> and somewhat, every, it was like 
a chorus abstraction. Um, first, to your point, you said you asked, are you on the right track? We all have our own individual opinions about um, um, what should happen to monuments that already exist, um, what should happen to murals. I, I don't think that to ask us if you're right, you're right. Your opinion is right for you. And everybody has their own opinions and the points that you make are, are valid. Um, in turn, when you talk about erasing history, um, now the Arts Commission is engaging in the erasure of history by saying that the Visual Arts Com Committee rejected all three of our proposals. There's no mention of my proposal having received top ranking at all. <laughs> at all, at all. So to your point, his, preserving history even when it is uh, egregious is important. And Where's it going to go? I'm, I'm still waiting. <laughs> do you have, how, do we, we have one more question, and then um, everybody has to get back up to campus. <laughs> yeah. Real quick, um, Lava, you know, I wonder, have you considered suing the city of San Francisco for violating the Sunshine Law? It's a no-brainer. I mean, that's bad. You know, this whole uh, episode has taken a tremendous amount of my time and energy, and the idea of hiring a lawyer, even if that attorney were to offer her or his services pro bono, it's, it's another, I don't, I don't want to be involved in, a, in suing someone. What I am happy to do is participate in as many conversations and in as many panels to raise awareness so that folks know what happened, what could happen, and so that this, this part of the history that is very much about the sculpture honoring Dr. Maya Angelou, so this history doesn't get erased. And I wanna just say one quick thing. There was an exhibit at the San Francisco Muni Museum, which is free, which is right across from the Ferry Building, about a year and a half ago or two years ago, about Maya Angelou, sweet small exhibit. But that's when I found out she had been the first African American Muni streetcar conductor. What year was that? So what? it was within the last two years, and they had her book there, and they had some photos, and it was really wonderful. And um, I just want to thank both of you ladies for the hard work you do, and Miss Howard, my sister and her family, and you probably know my sister, they live in the Hunters Point shipyard, the new housing. Mm. So I walk through there a lot, and when I see your pieces, okay. uh, my soul just soars. Well, it's made for the community. Yeah. Because they're the real, that, that they're the ones that And that is framed. public. I mean, people yeah. can go through, but I'm just saying that you know, your background, and everybody should see the documentary about um, Ashby Bart and what was ruined, the black community being destroyed, you know, their poems and everything taken to um, build the Bart station. Right. I think you, you created we, that. So I you. wanna thank you both, you know, cause art is that your essence from your soul poured outward, I think, for artists. It's a process that's mysterious to me. I'm not a, a visual artist but I so adore it. And I particularly love my sisters and brothers who do an African-American art. Thank Don't you. Don't see this show, everyone. I wanted to say that. Guy Bay has a show at SF MoMA. Oh. Oops, Guy Bay, go see it. He, he's an incredible photographer. Um, wait, where is it? SF MoMA. Also Next at, week it opens. Also at Rena Branston Gallery. Yes. Thank you both so much for joining us. Please do take a sheet that lists the locations of all of Mildred Howard's local public art. Thank you. <laughs>